He's based in Amsterdam and he's going to talk about barriers for tensor rank null bounds. Fizu, please go ahead. Uh, so this talk is pretty much uh, is, is pretty much going to be a hodgepodge of ideas that I want to present to you and kind of make more familiar to the community. Uh, the basic problem is we have this notion of tensor rank. <clears throat> that I'm pretty much sure all of you are familiar with. And uh, tensor rank behaves a little bit more notorious than matrix rank. Uh, for example, if you look at three tensors, say CN tensor CN tensor CN, we know that most tensors in here have rank about, uh, you know, uh, quadratic, most tensors. But Unlike the case of matrices, it's very hard to be able to explicitly prove that any particular tensor has a large tensor rank. So in the case of matrices, the maximum rank you can have is N. And you can give, if I ask you for any rank in between one to N, and you can always find me a matrix of that rank, pretty simply. For tensors, it's just much more complicated. And we have some ideas on how we can prove lower bounds. And they all seem to be very preliminary. They all seem to be uh, spin-offs of matrix rank are in some fashion uh, reduced to matrix rank and therefore not all that much powerful. And in this talk, I want to show you precisely uh, why they're not so much powerful and, and maybe give you some ideas of uh, what the blocks are. And the ideas there are already pretty elementary, but also probably significant in many other contexts that some of you might have come across. And the last part of this talk is not going to be my work. Uh, it's going to be the work of uh, Aframenko, Garg, Oliveira, and Victorson. Uh, I guess it was 2019, 18, 19, something like this. Uh, so here's the basic problem. Basic problem is, can you demonstrate a tensor in CN tensor CN tensor CN such that the rank of the tensor is uh, is superlinear? Let's just let's just leave it at that superlinear. Okay. Now there's a little bit of a technical thing in this problem. And I said, can you demonstrate? Maybe I should also say an explicit tensor. And this word explicit tends to have a pretty heavy meaning hidden to it that we don't often think about. But what this really means is I want a family of tensors, one for each n. And, and given any n, I want that tensor to be uh, polynomially generatable in some fashion. So, I mean, there's, there's kind of easy ways to give you tensors that I know for sure have superlinear tensor rank. Just pick numbers, just put numbers in, so, so n by n by n tensor is just like a multi-dimensional. Put numbers increasing so fast that uh, there's no chance of it having sublinear rank. Mm -hmm. That will work, that will work. It's just not explicit. And I don't really want to get into the technical definition of what explicit is, but I do want to kind of, Keep in mind that we can't just do whatever we like, but at the same time, uh, you should think of explicit as whatever you want to do should be polynomial time computable. I think that's a reasonable way to think of it. Uh, so the question is, how do we even show a lower bound on a tensor rank? Okay, so the question is, and there are some very naive ideas that you can do. So given one tensor, in CN tensor CN tensor CN, you can just view it as a tensor in CN tensor CN squared by grouping the second to uh, the second and third tensor factor. And then if you think about it, this is just matrices of size N by N squared. And you can look at uh, the rank here. So let's say T under this whole transformation goes to T prime. Then the tensor rank of T is at least the matrix rank of T prime. I hope everyone agrees with that. And I'm pretty sure all of you have seen this in some fashion or the other. This is just a basic flattening. 
where you just decide to forget about the second and third direction, collapse them together. And then you get a matrix. Uh, and the rank of that matrix is a lower bound for the rank of the tensor. And then the uh, proof of that should be pretty clear, pretty easy for anybody to do. But this gives you an idea of, of the kind of approach that people have taken for a long, long time uh, in terms of how to prove lower bounds for tensors. Uh, and in this case, it's already evident that I start with the tensor, I do some kind of tricks to bring it down to a matrix. And then I use matrix rank lower bounds as a way to give me tensor rank lower bounds. Okay. Now, there's obviously more complicated ones here. Now, because I've turned this, I don't know how pages are. Right? <laughs> So there's often slightly more complicated ones. So here's, here's an example of something. So let's say I have a tensor in C to the three, tensor C to the N, tensor C to the N, which because one of the dimensions is three, I can think of as three matrices, A, B, C, each one of them being N by N. I hope that's clear to everyone. I'm taking three by N by N matrix and I'm just cutting it along those slices to get three matrices. And I can have a map that goes to 3n by 3n matrices. And that map is something that looks like, no, no, no. <laughs> so there's a linear map here that I take from 3 by n by n tensors to 3n by 3n matrices. And it does basically this thing. It, it puts it in, in, in a block form, which looks vaguely skew symmetric. Uh, and now the claim is that uh, so if I call this, if I call this T prime, then the claim is that the tensor rank of T is greater than three by two times the rank of T prime. No, sorry, it's just the uh, rank of T prime over two. It's not three. Mm. Okay. And what's the idea here? The idea here is kind of very simple in nature. It's the idea. The idea is show that rank one tensors go to rank two matrices. So this is a linear map and I'm making a claim that any rank one tensor will go to a matrix of rank two. And that's also kind of clear. You can, you can work this out in any number of ways, but believe me for now. And once you do that, you see that any rank n tensor will go to a sum of at most and any rank k tensor will go to a sum of at most uh, k matrices of rank two and therefore can have rank at most two times k. And then I just unwind that and put it in, put it down to this uh, inequality here. But as you can see, even with this kind of slightly non-trivial way of doing things, uh, the best bound I can still get is three n over two it's still kind of linear. And this is, I mean, you can have smarter and smarter and smarter constructions, especially if you have some idea of representation theory, or if you have some kind of uh, experience with symmetries, you can try and make more and more complicated and more and more intricate constructions of this form, uh, where you take any, where you construct all kinds of linear maps from tensors to matrices, and then use that. But uh, what is the general way of using such a thing? So the general form of such a method is called a rank method. And it basically does this. So say you have a map from CN tends to CN tends to CN to matrices. They don't have to be square. And let me call this map phi with the property that phi of any rank one tensor to rank less equal A matrices. Okay. So if you have these properties, from this you conclude that for any tensor T, its tensor rank is at most the rank of phi of T divided by, is, is at least the rank of phi of T divided by A. I, I certainly see a lot of people in the audience, but I don't know if they're allowed to ask questions or what that format looks like. They are allowed. <laughs> I think they understand. Otherwise, yeah, please, definitely please, speak. Please do ask questions. <laughs> we'll be quiet for a yeah. <laughs> So this is what 
it really means to be a rank method. And now I'm going to make this claim, which is definitely from EG or W. Rank methods cannot give, cannot give lower bounds better than 6n plus 2. Let's leave it at that. That's a slightly weaker claim than what you can actually prove. But that's the one that I will show you. Okay. And remember again, and, and this is very specific to three tensors. You can, you can, of course, generalize the result to larger number of tensor factors and, and stuff like this. And even if they have uneven dimensions, you will still get some bound. Sometimes it can be meaningless, but uh, most of the time it's pretty meaningful and, and shows you some kind of barrier. Does, does everybody understand this claim? It should really be a theorem, but <laughs> I'm going to take that as a yes. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and tell you this, the proof of this theorem. And it's, and to me, at least when I reworked it myself, it, it felt pretty simple. So that's, that's the form that I want to present it to you. In. So again, you start with this map. It's a linear map from n by n by n matrices, uh, n by n by n tensors to k by l matrices. And you know that rank one tensors go into rank less equal A matrices. So what I'm really going to show you, and this is what you have to watch out for in the end, is I will show to show that the image of rank one tensor is inside. So this is K by L matrices, right? So there's going to be some change of basis kind of thing that I will show. And I will show you that every time you're in such a situation, the image of rank one tensors is always going to be in this L-shaped submatrix form, subset, subspace, where this big block of zeros exists. And let's say this is going to be some N1 times A, and it's going to be some N2 times A. And then I would need N1 plus N2 less equals 6N plus 2. And I just want to spend a minute looking at this picture. So what do I get if I show that every rank, in some basis, every rank one tensor goes into a matrix like this? Then I know that if you sum up any number of rank one tensors, it doesn't matter how many, it's going to stay within that subspace. So the rank of any tensor, which is always going to be a sum of rank one tensors, when you push, so any tensor you take, is going to be a sum of rank one tensors. So you push it forward by phi, by phi, and you end up with a matrix with a particular shape. And, and therefore the matrix rank of that thing is going to be at most N1 plus N2 times A. You can look at the column rank of this piece and the, sorry, you can look at the column rank of the long piece and the row rank of the, of, of the white piece. And that gives you a bound on the matrix rank. So this tells you, for example, that not just the image of rank one tensors, but the image of phi itself is inside rank less equal N1A plus N2A matrices, okay? So the best lower bound you could prove using this method is at most N1 plus N2 times A divided by A. You have to divide by A because that's what rank one matrices are going to. Rank one tensors are going to. Yes, I see a hand. Yeah, so the, the K and the L in the statement, uh, yeah. they, they decided a posteriori. I mean, which is the relation between K and L and N? Uh, so you start with this map phi, right? This is something that anybody could give to you. Yeah. And so any, and, I mean, rank methods are kind of general. So I could come up with a rank method tomorrow that says, let's look at this complicated linear map. And in that linear map, there's no relationship between K and L and N. Okay? K and L could be as large as you want. They could be as small as you want. They could be anything. But independent of K and L, you will always be able to put it in such a format. Did I answer the question? I mean, yeah. If they are big, yes. But if they are too small, there can be not enough space for the right number of columns and the right number of rows. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you're correct. You're correct. Uh, 
it just makes our problem. I mean, it, it makes the result stronger if k and l are too small. Like if k and l are smaller than n squared, then you couldn't prove more than a lower bound of n. I mean, if, if k and l are like two or three, then the best lower bound you can prove is anyway two or three. But you're absolutely right. Uh, but it just becomes immaterial for what we're doing. And you can always pad k and l by putting zeros and then, and you can make it work. Thanks. So, uh, so that's the best low bound we can do. So now you know what, what I'm really trying to do. I'm going to take any such map like this, and I'm going to try and show you that change of basis that will put it inside such a matrix form. Okay. And this is where uh, it gets just a little bit tricky, but you have to hold on for me, hold, you know, you have to just hold on with me for a little time, and, and then the picture becomes pretty clear. So again, we start with this map phi from Cn tensor Cn tensor Cn into K by L matrices. Yeah, just think of K and L as really large. That's the best way to do this. Inside here, you have the subset S of rank one tensors, right? And the set of rank one tensors, we can parameterize by C to the N by let's call this map uh, P, C to the N, direct sum C to the N, direct sum C to the N. If you know what this map is, you kind of know it, X, Y, Z, so three vectors of size N by N will go to X, tensor Y, tensor Z. Everybody's familiar with this parameterization, right? So, what I'm going to do is I wanted to show that image of rank one tensors under phi was in some particular form, right? So you wanted phi of rank one tensors inside some form like this. But I'm going to claim this is just the same thing as image of uh, P composed with phi. And I'm just going to give a name. I'm going to give a name to this function, to this composition. I will call it capital L, which is P composed with phi. And L is a map from C to the three N into matrices, correct? And then the one thing I want you to observe is that the degree of L, what is the map L? The map first does, did I get the composition wrong? Yeah, I didn't want to say it, but, <laughs> but I think it. <laughs> so this map L is a composition of two maps. The first is the parameterization map that is of degree three. And that you can clearly see because every entry of this tensor product is X, I, Y, J, Z, K. Mm -hmm. That's a degree three map. And then the map phi itself is linear. So that doesn't change the degree at all. Mm -hmm. So when you look at this map L, you can think of it as a matrix of size K by L. And each entry is some degree three polynomial in the three n variables. So that's that's how we want to think of it. So L is a k by L matrix. Each entry is a degree three polynomial in x's, y's, and z's. Where by this I really just mean x one to x n, y one to y n, z one to z n. So in three n variables. That's kind of important. So you should think of it as degree three and three times n variables. Okay, so those are the two important things. So I will move on and I will now just focus on this map L. So L maps C to the three n to K by L matrices and is of degree three. So what does this mean? This means that if I plug in some numbers for, uh, so if I take in any particular values, alpha one to alpha three n, just put in complex numbers, then the rank of this matrix is at most A. I, I will pull two slides back for just a moment. Remember the hypothesis that we have on this map is that it sends rank one tensors to rank less equal A matrices. And L by virtue of how it's parameterized, it first hits rank one tensors and then pushes it forward by phi. Therefore, the rank of that is going to be at most A. Okay. 
So this is true for all complex numbers. So what this means is that if I replace these complex numbers by variables, its rank is also at most A. But now this here, we need to see is a matrix with entries in the function field. That's how we should think of it. Okay. The way to think of it is if you want to look, if you want to understand the rank of this symbolic matrix L of Z1 to Z3n, then you look for some minors that vanish and minors that don't vanish. And whichever minors vanish or don't vanish is reflected by being able to plug in enough values inside complex numbers. And therefore those two ranks are the same. Okay. So now I have a symbolic matrix, or uh, rather a matrix with entries in the function field whose rank is at most A. And by virtue of how matrices work, I can tell that this is a sum of at most A rank one tensors. So let's just say it's equal to at most A. So I equal to one to A, PI of Z tensor QI of Z, where PI of Z and QI of Z are vectors. So maybe the right way to do this is, this is, so let me call this function field K. So this is inside K to the, uh, let me call this, uh, uh, yeah, let me just call it K, it's fine. Is inside K to the K and QI of Z is inside K to the L. Yeah, this, so that's clear, right? I just moved into the function field and I decomposed it as sum of rank one matrices. And I'm writing it in the language of tensors because I don't know how to draw matrices that easily. So now here comes perhaps the, the main idea. And I don't quite know how anybody thought of this, but uh, I mean, people do think of such things. It's not that it's, it is beyond people think of it, but, but it is definitely the part that I found most uh, uh, difficult to find natural. So you have it as a sum from one to A of these things. Now these are vectors of rational functions. Now the claim is you may have to shift by a constant, some constant C, but you can write these guys all as power series. So this can get a little bit involved, but basically what happens is you have a bunch of vectors, each of them having each of them I mean, each of their entries are rational functions. Now, every rational function has a power series around most points. So there are certain points where you can't give it a power series, but around most points, it has a power series. And you have a finite number of these. So you can find some point around which you can find power series for all of them simultaneously. And that's that shift C that I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, and so what, what I end up writing is L of Z plus C is equal to sum from I one to A, sum over E P I E Z to the E, tensor sum over F Q I F Z to the F. And I just want to note that these P I E's and Q I F's, they're vectors, they're concrete vectors now, and they have, and, and they're vectors with complex entries because all I did was I expanded everything out into power series and I pulled out coefficients term by term. Okay, so this is the size of tricky part. And once you think of it, the rest of it comes out pretty clearly. Okay, I shifted this L, which previously was a degree three polynomial. It still stays degree three because shifting a variable by a constant doesn't change anything. So this still has degree three. So in this huge long thing, I only have to care about the terms whose degrees are at most three, such that degree of E plus degree of F is less equal three. Right? On the left, I have a polynomial. On the right, I have a power series. But since I know that, on the, that, that there's an equality, I can forget about all the higher order terms and I can restrict myself just to the degree less equal three terms. Is the other terms are they going to cancel out or yeah. that that's the magic they just have to cancel out yeah they have to it's not like we're approximating and then trying to pull something out there, right. there's equality there so the rest of them just have to cancel out mm -hmm. okay so now i'm going to copy this thing over again 
So L of Z plus C is sum over I E F degree of E less equal, sorry, degree of degree of E plus degree of F less equal three of P I E Z to the E tensor Q I F Z to the F. Now I want to show you this matrix again. If you remember what we wanted, we wanted a matrix like this. And I want to turn from this matrix notation into tensor notation. So what you can think of this matrix really as F to the, that's a K by L matrix, right? So it's like F to the K tensor U1 plus U2 tensor F to the L. So there's no F to C. Is, is everybody reasonably comfortable with that kind of a translation? So I'm going to take Correct. Right. Yeah. Yeah. for multi indices, right? Both the indexes? Are they just single? Just single? No. Oh, this E and F? Yeah, there was a question whether there are multi indices or like single indices. But there are single indices because Z is just a variable. Yeah. No, no, no. Z, Z, is, Z is a vector variable, Z1 to Z3 again. So they are multi indices. And by degree E, you mean the sum of the elements? Yeah, the, that's right, the total degree. That's, that's the one problem with power series is, is when you try to explain, you have to choose whether you want to put that underscore or not. And that makes it either completely messy and difficult to parse or or you're given to this part where you can misinterpret whether it's a variable or a vector variables. But yes, Z is a vector of variables, E is a multi-degree. And when I say degree of E, I mean the total degree, just sum up all the de individual degrees. Okay. So now I tell you what U1 and U2 are. That's the fastest way of doing this. You can stare at it and you can try and figure out what U1 and U2 are, but really U1 is going to be the span uh, I guess of Q I F such that degree of F is less equal one. And U2 is going to be the span of P I E such that degree of E is less equal one. Okay. And to show that image of L is inside C to the K tensor U1 plus U2 tensor C to the L. I just have to show that each of these individual terms P I E Z E tensor Q I F Z F is inside that. Whenever I replace Z with some numbers alpha one to alpha three M. Okay, so here I will just try and put this in the same screen so that we can see it. So when I plug in some alpha, what I get is sum of I E F P I E alpha to the E tensor Q I F alpha to the F. And if I want to show that image of L is inside this guy, then I basically have to show that L, when I plug in, uh, in for Z, if I plug in any uh, complex vector alpha, and I look at the corresponding L of alpha plus C, I have to show that that is inside this guy, inside the sum C to the K tensor U1 plus U2 tensor C to the L. And L of alpha plus C itself is a sum of many terms. If I show that each one of those terms is in there, then the sum is also in there because it's a linear subspace. Now why you did, pick any one of these, sorry. Why did you put the degree one bound? Like degree F is the most one. Yes, that's 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 the meat of the whole story. So here's, here's how we see it. So when you look at it, you look at any, any of these terms. I know that degree of E plus degree of F is, is at most three. That means either degree of E is less equal one or degree of F is less equal one. They cannot both be greater than one. Um, um, yeah. So if degree of E is less equal one in that term, then it belongs to U2 tensor CL. Yeah. And if degree of F is less equal one, then it belongs to CK tensor U1. So now you know what this matrix looks like. And now what you really need to know finally is what's the dimension of U1 and what's the dimension of U2? What is the dimension of U1? Well, it's a span of QIF and it's indexed by degree of F, all monomials of, basically degree of F is less equal one is one constraint and I ranges from one to A. So you have A times the number of monomials of degree at most one 
how many monomials of degree at most one do you have? Z itself is Z1 to Z3n. So the number of monomials of degree at most one is 3n plus one because you have the constant, you have the degree zero term. So the dimension of u is less equal a times 3n plus one and dimension of a two, u2 two is less than a times 3n plus one. So if I look back at this matrix, what I'm doing is I'm calling this, I'm putting here 3n plus one times a and out here I'm putting 3n plus one times a. And I will still try to stick within the same slide because it's all there. Therefore, the best lower bound you can get is two times three n plus one times a, and I have to divide this by a, which is six n plus three. So the idea itself is not too difficult to understand. It doesn't involve anything all that technical in nature. You don't have to pull in uh, sophisticated ideas of any sort. But it does have this one neat trick where you go from coefficients to symbolic matrices, and then you switch to power series, and then you truncate, and then you play this very neat trick of the fact that three is an odd number. And therefore, when you have some of degrees adding up to three, at least one of them must be at most less than equal to one. And that, and that really was what made this thing linear, right? Because if I had to take degree greater than one, if I had to take degree of f less equal to, I would have quadratic. I would not be able to prove the same bound, the same barrier. Okay. So that's what the proof of this thing is. And, and I guess all I want to do is I want to point out what is making this proof work. And there's just key features in the proof, right? It's basically a parameterization of rank one tensors. And it is counting monomials. The rest of it is kind of the same. So instead of taking the standard parameterization, I could parameterize rank one matrices by any sort of thing I liked. It could be stupid, it could be really smart. And I could go through the entire procedure from start to end. And at the very end, I would just have to see what's the smartest way to split those monomials up. And if I can find a smart enough way, I'll get a, I'll get a barrier of some sort. So now what I want to do is I want to actually tell you two variants of this that I thought of. One which I can do something about and the other I hope somebody has some ideas about. Okay. So here are the two variants. So the first one is, uh, suppose you have a special tensor. It has some special properties that I don't really want to tell you. I don't know. Maybe you're working with some tensor and you want to see how much of a lower bound you can prove possibly because there's one specific in instance that you came up with when you were wiring a computer somewhere mm -hmm. or something like that. Uh, and then you want to know what's the best lower bounds you can prove for these kind of things. So here's the idea here. So back then we parameterized rank one tensors, right? But because you have a special tensor T, you can take a subset and as long as the span of the subset contains the tensor, you can get away with parameterizing. Okay, I hope everybody sees that. And I will pull back two pages just to make a little point again. Remember, okay. you start with this whole, whole linear map and then you parameterize rank one tensors. Now, instead of rank one tensors, I'll parameterize the subset and I will then continue with this whole process. And, and what it'll tell me is that this subset will go into matrices of a certain form. And therefore, anything in the linear span of that subset will also go into matrices of that form. And therefore, that barrier will be valid for anything in that span. And that same point is basically what I wrote here. And so if you have a special tensor, you can do this. So it doesn't matter. So, so we don't, so this is not like restricting our rank decompositions to elements in S, or is it? Yes. It's not. It's not. Uh, okay. not. It's not. It's, it's about the analysis where you, yeah. Yes, exactly. So we're not restricting to trying to write T as a sum of things inside S. It's, mm -hmm. just, it's, just, it's just enough that the span of S contains T. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, you wouldn't even need S to be inside rank one tensors. For example, S could be inside rank three tensors, but you'd have to adjust that A appropriately. And you're, uh -huh. you're very unlikely to get anything too good because you'll end up with more variables and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's not the point. 
S, S could be anything. As long as you have a bound for where S goes to and you can rework your rank and stuff, you can, you can make this kind of an argument. And I will actually tell you something I can do here is I can take the matrix multiplication tensor, uh, N, N, N. This is a tensor inside CN squared tensor CN squared tensor CN squared. And the claim is the EG or W bound barrier, I would call it, is six N squared plus two, right? I just replace N with N squared, okay? And my claim is this idea above idea can give a barrier of six N squared minus six N plus four. Not, it's not too great an improvement, but this is just what I did on, on, on a plane ride back home after uh, after that workshop in Lausanne a couple of months ago. Not Lausanne, uh, Toulouse. Right. What are the best lower bounds again? Like uh, for me? Uh, it's like two n squared ish. Two n squared. Yeah. yeah. So that so there is a gap to fill. Mm -hmm. We know we're in this regime where it's between two n squared and six n squared that rank methods can give. There is a gap to fill. And there's reason enough to believe that that gap can be filled in one direction of some form. Uh, well, it's still pretty unclear where exactly it falls. And I think it's, okay, I, I, I'm able to do this, but the, the way I do this is kind of very simple. And I will show you this to you. It's very, it's, it's very naive. So if you look for rank one tensors inside CN squared tensor CN squared CN squared, Inside here, you have rank one tensors. Inside here, you have <coughs> the subset S, which is going to be EIJ, EJK, EKI. <coughs> one less equal IJK less equal. N. Sorry, this is not quite how I wanted to say it. So inside here, you have rank one tensors which is parametrized by CN squared, direct sum CN squared, direct sum CN squared. So that's not a subset. This is a parametrization. Okay, it's, it's just the same parametrization that you have, which sends something plus something plus something to tensor of those things. And <clears throat> I have the subset, which is going to be the span of this. Okay, so under the parametrization, this guy here goes to EIJ, tensor EJK, tensor EKI. And you know that the span of these guys contains the matrix multiplication tensor. Okay. So if I just parameterize the space S with fewer variables, I'm happy because I just compose a parameterization and I just end up with fewer variables, but the degree doesn't change of the map. And to parameterize it with fewer variables, I don't even have to try hard. Because my claim is going to be that the dimension of S, so S here is a subset of CN squared, direct sum CN squared, direct sum CN squared. My claim is dimension of S is, uh, is not all of 3N squared, it's 3N squared minus 3N plus 1. And that's my savings. That 3N minus 1 is the savings. And if I run through the argument, I get the barrier of 6N squared minus 6N plus 4. Okay, so here's here's one open question for for, or at least a potential thing that people can try and do is, can you do better? I mean, there's the, it's kind of an open game because if you see EIJ tensor, EJK tensor, EKI is a very specific way of finding a bunch of tensors that add up to the rank to, to the matrix multiplication tensor. We know many other kinds of decompositions. Like, what if you took Strassen's decomposition and ran with it? Mm -hmm. Or maybe something slightly more involved. I mean, Strassen's decomposition doesn't scale directly, but something more involved. Would you be able to get a better bound than this? No, there's 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 no sense in which this is all that optimal in terms of finding barriers. You could also have a trade-off in which you have, I mean, in which you can parameterize with slightly larger degree, but with a lo lot fewer variables. And then you can see whether the numbers work out or not at the end. Mm -hmm. so that's the one other thing that I don't really have a sense of. If you take a parameterization, um, mm -hmm. I really cannot tell you by looking at it whether the barrier is going to be good or bad mm -hmm. until I just go through the numbers. Mm -hmm. 
So that's another thing. But the other variant is one that excites me a little bit more. And here's, here's what I want to say. So I just told you, you don't have to parameterize all rank one tensors, and then you can get away with, if you want to just prove a barrier for a special tensor. But even if you just want to prove a general barrier for all tensors, you can still get away with parameterizing something smaller than rank one tensors. And here's how. You take rank one tensors, you take some subset of it, and you do this whole thing, and you will get a barrier for uh, all tensors in the span of S. That's kind of what I told you last time in, in the previous period. Mm -hmm. Now, what if you remember <coughs> CN tensor, CN tensor, CN has a lot of symmetries. So you have this huge group, GLN tensors, GLN tensors, GLN, and probably a semi-direct product with symmetric group, all of which preserves tensor rank. So if you have a barrier for span of S, then you also have a barrier for G times span of S. And you also have a barrier for its closure. So if you are able to get this and get away with a better parameterization for S, you will get better barriers. That almost sounds to me like finding a variety with certain properties, a parameterized variety, let's say. And the question is, can you come up with such a parameterized variety, which hopefully is parameterized by low degree because I think this, I mean, as soon as you go into higher degrees, <clears throat> the number of monomials blows up a little too much. So you want to keep the degrees as low as possible and hopefully save as much as possible on the number of variables. And I'm giving you a good way of throwing in a large group. If, if you needed some number of variables to parameterize rank one matrices, then the set S should be much smaller than that. You should be able to get away with some smaller number of variables. And that's basically the hope that I had and finding such a thing. Uh, I guess with that, I'm going to stop and, and wait for questions. Thanks. Questions? Yeah. Hey, so, um, hi, <laughs> it's Matthias. I don't know if you can see me. Um, it seems like this method generalizes to higher order tensors. Um, can you say something about it? Like tensors of order four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, it, it generalizes and basically uh, you do the same thing and you come down to matrices and you have to split it. And instead of degree less equal one, as in this case, it will be degree less equal. Uh, if you have ordered D tensors, then D over two, you may have to put a floor or a ceiling appropriately on one side, maybe not on both sides, mm -hmm. something like this. But uh, the idea is essentially the same other than working out the numbers a little bit more cumbersome. So what is the scale in the number of factors for your barrier? So if you have, uh, let's say, D tensor factors, then it will give you a barrier of the order N to the D over two, the floor of N to the D over two, more or less. That's basically what you would get by naively flattening it yeah. in the smartest possible way yes. and add some big constant to that. Multiply, yeah, a big multiply to that. <clears throat> That's basically where it stands, yeah. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, so maybe good to point out what are all the methods that are contained in this, right? So, of course, there's young flattening, that's clear. Mm -hmm. Like partial derivative, like the whole shifted partial derivative stuff is also part of it, right? I don't yeah. know about shifted partial derivatives, but partial derivatives, definitely. Partial derivatives, yes. Um, is there any idea of how to circumvent it? Like, are there any, <laughs> if you ever thought about, yeah, if you want to circumvent the barrier, what can one do? That's right. So, I mean, as far as JM or some people are concerned, they do have some techniques that circumvent it, but they don't really get much past what's currently known anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, I think 2N is more or less known and they can get slightly beyond 2N. And uh, which feels like a breakthrough to some, which doesn't feel like a breakthrough to others. Uh, but that, that's, that's story aside. Uh, I think every time you throw a group action in there, you're likely to bypass this. But then every time you throw a group action in there, the tensors that you're catching onto are very special. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So that's the trade-off. So it, to me, it, it's not clear that throwing in group actions is actually going to help you catch the general picture. I mean, there may be a trade-off where you prove n to the three over two or something, which is still which is still great. Uh, mm -hmm. But you still won't be catching very general tensors, which uh, which also is not so clear that it matters. You just have to find one that has a quadratic thing. So there are lots of trade-offs, and I think at some point you have to you have to really wonder what will tell you that it's quadratic instead of just trying to pick up some idea that you have and running with it, hoping that what comes out at the end is super linear. Mm -hmm. yeah. and that's something maybe we don't really know. Mm -hmm. More questions? I think we're happy. Yeah. Thanks again.